Acts 21. We're going to look at the life of Paul. Ron and I have been talking about this from his study in James when he, he went to this passage and saw how James dealt with Paul and how Paul was vulnerable to go back to the law, to go back to the temple and perform this Nazarite vow all in an attempt to win over the legalist in Jerusalem. So if you're in 21, let's see, let's, let's pray. You know the procedure. Confess sin. And uh, so let's go to the Lord. Well, Father, I got plenty to confess. And so there it is. And I thank you for the ministry of the Spirit. It gives us eyes to see what the scriptures teach and to parlay that into daily living that not only blesses us but glorifies you. And that's our goal and our desire, Father. And so we pray that you'll lead us one more step toward that end tonight in Christ's name. Amen. In Acts 21, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem and he's sailing, and he's stopping at these places. And in, uh, it says in 21, it came about that they set sail, they went to Rhodes, and they ended up in Tyre. Uh, for the ship had to unload its cargo. That's verse 4, I mean 3. And then 4, after looking up the disciples, they went and found the believers in the church. And uh, we stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul, and here's a key phrase, through the Spirit. This wasn't just their opinion. This is through the Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. The Spirit is telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. But he's got this offering that he's engineered from all these Gentile churches. You know, he's gone all over the world collecting this money. It must have been a large sum. They had several believers with them. Uh, and, and people of great renown, well-documented people of integrity had this money. And uh, somewhere in Corinthians, he explains that somebody in important, somebody like Luke or somebody was with them. But anyway, uh, so they kept telling him. And when it came about that our days were ended, we departed, and they end up... Uh, uh, where did they end up? They, returned, they, they went on board the ship and they returned home, these people to return home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we were arri arrived at the Ptolemies. We greeted the brethren and he stayed with them for a day. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And as we were staying... Uh, there for some day, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here's the second warning. And, we, when, he, and when we had heard this, we all as well as the local residents began begging him, Paul, not to go. He answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Sounds like Peter. Peter was willing to die for the Lord, but at the moment, this is the night they took him, he was willing to die, but he wasn't willing to live. So Paul's willing to throw everything out to, to take this offering to Jerusalem, and you got to ask yourself, why? Why? Well, Paul's got his own agenda, apart from God is God's agenda. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, well, the will of the Lord be done. I mean, that's what you do with people that won't listen. You have to, you have to turn them over to the Lord and let, the, and let God's will be done. And listen, that's, 
That's going to happen in Paul's life. Because even though he's going to go into, he's already in disobedience. Listen, Paul is already in reversionism. Can you see that? He is rejecting the voice of the Spirit through at least two, three different sources have confronted him and said, you're going to Jerusalem, don't go there. In fact, God had already told him to go west to go to Rome. He already had marching orders to go to Rome. But he's determined he's going to go to Jerusalem and take this offering and meet with all these, quote, he called them super apostles. And we'll look at all that. But then it goes on and talks about when they get to Jerusalem, uh, in verse 17, we had come to Jerusalem. The brothers received us gladly, and the following day Paul went in to meet with James. And didn't you all read this other night with Ron out of the book of James? Last Wednesday maybe? Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, that's what inspired me to go here and talk about this. And, and all the elders were present. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard of it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brother, and here's James, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for what? God's grace. The law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Because why? Because the law was, had come to an end. It was gone. This was the rev, part of the revelation God gave Paul initially. Now, James says, now, you're going to get in trouble here. And he says, you've been teaching these Gentiles, these Jews, to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? We got a problem here. They will certainly hear that you have come. They're going to come and be angry, which is what happened. Therefore, do this. We have four men who are under a Nazarite vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them according to the what? the law pay their expenses let them shave their heads all will know there is nothing to the things which have been said about you but you yourself walk orderly keeping the law do you think Paul was still keeping the law not a chance everywhere he went he explained that Christ was the end of the law the law was done the veil, when the veil was, t was torn in two the Holy of Holies was over. It's now the body of the believer. He's already into this theology. Paul already knows all these things. But look, he is willing to go along with James to get something. To get something. I mean, if he's out on the field as a missionary and somebody comes up and says that, What's he going to say? He's going to say, you're, you're crazy. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go back to the law. I'm not going to pay for these guys to take a Nazarite vow. That stuff has come and gone. I'm not going back to it. But he is willing to compromise what he knows to be the truth to gain something. And it's, pick, it's presented to him in the guise of, of bringing the church together, the legalist and the, Gent the Jews and Gentiles together for the sake of unity. I don't know if you've ever been to other churches, the normal denominational churches. <laughs> the church I grew up in, they said, we don't really get too deep in the Bible. It causes divisions. Seriously. They would prefer we just love one another so that we can maintain unity, which was really more like a social unity, not a spiritual one. Anyway, let's look at a few ideas. The Lord himself had met with Paul, Saul, who became Paul, giving him the most complete revelation and explanation of the divine plan and, and how the scriptures fit together. Paul had the revelation. 
without Paul's understanding of the whole scriptures, I don't believe we can understand it accurately. People under, misunderstood it. The people, this is my view, believe it or not. The people who had the Spirit all through history, in the age of the Gentiles, in the age of the Jews, in the church age, the people like Simeon, who the Mary and Joseph met on the temple steps, who had the Spirit, he understood what the Scriptures were teaching. People all along the way that had the Spirit could understand. The Spirit was available to anybody. All, Jesus said, all you got to do is ask, and the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. Anybody could have had the Holy Spirit all through history. They could have understood what the Scriptures were teaching, but Paul came along and summarized the whole thing with his teachings. So that's who we're going to appeal to when we to deal with his problem here. Now, his superior knowledge... He, he communicated this through his 13 books. His superior knowledge did not insulate him from his old man beliefs and earthly ambition. That's Acts 21. God used his failure, but look, listen, here's what's beautiful. This is beautiful, and you need to, you need to be grateful. God uses our failures to reveal to us the root issues that need to be changed in our heart. He's going to use this whole experience to purify Paul's earthly ambition. And when we get to Philippians 3, we're going to see, which we won't do tonight. I've, I've got the next Wednesday too, but uh, uh, our pastor has got, he said, I've, I've got some extra study to do, so I need you to help out. So anyway, we're doing that. Uh, Paul's Earthly ambition had to be purified from, from, from his soul, from his heart, so that he was no longer vulnerable to this ambition of, being, of needing to be recognized for what he has done. He's vulnerable, and God's going to do this. So, first of all, knowledge of God's plan, understood and believed, is the essential starting point, and we know that. You start at salvation and security, you got to have eternal security. You can't grow without eternal security. Can't grow. Because your whole life is about hanging on to what you can lose if you misbehave enough. Your whole view of God is, a, is as a judge. And at salvation, you pass through the courtroom of heaven. Your sins are dealt with. You pronounce righteous, and you no longer deal with God as a judge. You deal with God as a father. Okay, it's only as when you can see God as a father and you're through the judgment that you can really grow in grace and knowledge because it's through God's forgiveness of your daily patterns of sin that you grow to love him. That's what causes you to ultimately go, this guy's crazy. This guy, loves, I mean, how can you care that much about me because I've confessed this same thing to you 1,000 times this week. And what you say is you clean me up and you say, go again, son. Go again. Grow out of that. But spiritual growth leading to maturity. We inhale the categories and form the big picture and visualize the conflict. We get into transformation. We're renewing the mind and your beliefs. Uh, you build the new man system. Doctrine builds the new man system. That's what it does. It builds a new man system. The thoughts of Jesus Christ, the very mindset of Christ, the belief system that he used on earth. Now, he was under the law. It's not exactly the same, but it's in essence. It's the church age uh, economy. It's the church age way of thinking about everything that he pioneered for us and has passed on to us. And doctrine builds that so that we can implement it in our life. Adversity and failure in our life creates the awareness of these things within us that need to change. 
we're going to see with Paul, he, he, he justified himself all the way to Jerusalem. He justified himself. The old man, listen, it's insidious. It will make it look like the new man, except for your motives. You look just like the new man. You're doing all the new man stuff, but your motives are still for me, 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 me. So, in spite of Paul's superior knowledge of God's plan, he remained vulnerable to his old man motives. His desire for recognition from his peers and from his people, the Jews. And we're going to see that in Philippians 3 where he says, the things that I used to think were so important, and he mentions his past life as a Jew. I used to think this was everything, and winning the Jews for Christ was everything. It was my fulfillment. I now realize was dung. Scubala, he called it. So, his writings before and after Acts 21, the Jerusalem experience, handled the issue of transformation and spiritual growth differently. From Romans to Ephesians, there's a, uh, a distinct change in the way he talks about spiritual growth and transformation. In Romans chapter 6, which is a huge passage, in chapter 12, there's no mention of taking off old man beliefs. But when you get to Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, that's his methodology. Paul's ambition, his desire for recognition, which I'll, I'll document for you. You know something that's important? We read the Bible, and I, I, we read the Bible like everything in it is true, like everything in it is right. For instance, I used to read the, the book of Job, and I would read Job's friends who were all wrong in what they were saying and think that the, and even quote them because I didn't understand that the Bible is teaching us the reality. What Paul did in Jerusalem, I, for years I thought, well, it must have been the right thing to do. It definitely was not. Definitely was not. So the Bible is reporting to us what Paul did wrong and what God did with it. So his ambition and desire for recognition, what I call, think of as his dream, his old man dream, caused him to reject God's warnings and attempt a compromise with believing Jews still under the Mosaic law. He says, uh, to the Jews I became a Jew. Paul, you'd have been better off to the Jews to, be, to remain a Christian. Been a lot better off. So would they. It's amazing what Ron and I were talking about how James, this has been 10 years since the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15, and James has gone all the way back to circumcision, he's back under the law. Man, they had a hard time letting go of that. But you got 2,000 years of tradition with huge momentum rolling down on these people. They're born into it, and they believe the law is still God's plan. It was Paul who came along and explained literally dispensations. You don't really understand the dispensational scheme until you get to Paul. So, his knowledge was incredible. So, you, you, you got Acts 21, 10 through 14. Uh, you got the, the one before is the believers in Tyre. Then you got Agabus. And in 21 through 26, you got him in the temple making a vow, helping these guys make a vow. So, let's look, a li let's look at Paul. Let's look a little bit at Paul. And uh, so I've done a little profile. Saul of Tarsus. He's born in a Gentile city. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews, but he's born in a Gentile city. And Tarsus was, a, was an important city. It was an educational city. It, they had universities there. They had, they had uh, higher learning there. This is 
probably where his thirst for knowledge and higher learning came from. Um, his father had settled there. His father was a Pharisee, and they were strict Jews. They, they, you know, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's the right day to have it done. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews and all this stuff. He's so proud of all that. Uh, he's named after the first king of Israel, Saul who the Jews, see, we look back on Saul and think, what a failure, what a dummy. But they didn't feel that way about Saul. Saul was the first king. He was a great man, and he had his spiritual failures. But you know what? He was way more moral. He was made way more orderly and kept the law than David. God loved David because of his heart and his faith and his willing to give everything to God. The Jews love Saul. So he's proud of his name, and I'm going to tell you, it didn't take him long as a Christian to get rid of it. Paul's small figure compared to Saul's huge figure, he renamed himself Paul the Little One, we believe indicating his humility as he compared himself with Christ. Rather than comparing himself with Saul, who he is named for, he, he started comparing himself with Jesus, and he realized, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm a little bitty guy. And, and that's his humility. It's a wonderful thing. Tarsus, an educational center of the Roman Empire, it was often compared with Athens for its educational emphasis, if that means anything to you. Athens, Greece, was one of the great educational centers. Look. What went on in Athens, Greece, 500 years before Christ, is still impacting you and I today. With their philosophical understanding, their logic, their architecture, medical stuff, all many, many things, the language. So this, when Tarsus is compared to that city, it tells you, it gives you, kind of an under a flavor for what was there and what Paul grew up with, at least until he was an early teenager because as, probably at 13 when he became an adult, he, we believe he went to Jerusalem. We believe he moved to Jerusalem and sat under Gamaliel. You know, Gamaliel, there was Hillel and Gamaliel, and they had these schools, and you'd send your child there who aspired to the Sanhedrin, aspired to the ministry. And so Paul aspired to be a great leader in Israel. And he was not only very politically savvy, but he was great with religion, and he was a follower of the law. He was very devout. And he was sent there at an early age and set under Gamaliel. But I'm going to tell you something. He didn't learn a lot from him. Gamaliel, in Acts chapter 5, when Christianity first came about, and they, uh, they arrested Peter and James, and Gamaliel said, I'm going to caution you. If this is of the Lord, there's nothing you can do to stop it. If it's not, it'll phase out itself. He said, there's been five other messiahs just like this, but if this is of God, you don't want to get yourself in an op opposing position to what God is doing. But this is, this is Acts 5. By the time you get to Acts 7 or 8, what's Paul doing? Persecuting the church. He didn't listen at all. Part of that was his personality, his tendencies. Uh, Acts 22 tells us he was a Roman citizen. And my reading has taught me that being a Roman citizen in these outlying areas outside of Rome and Italy meant that you were automatically aristocracy. Wherever you went, if you were a Roman citizen, there, it was, it was, there were not that many of them. He was born one. His father had somehow become a Roman citizen. And so he thought of himself very highly. Uh, it gave him position and prominence in the Roman world. He's a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee, very uh, strict adherence to the rituals of the law, blameless under the law. 
sent to Jerusalem at age 13 to study under the great Gamaliel, whose warning in Acts 5 he rejected. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, verse 9, we learned that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the synagogue of freedmen, which was a group of guys, and they debated Stephen. This is who Stephen's great debate and discussion was with these guys. And he was part of that. When you get to the execution of Stephen in Acts 8, he was in full agreement with the execution of Stephen. In fact, when you get to Acts 26, he tells one of the kings that he, he said, I caused the torture and execution of many men and women. He mentions the fact that he tortured women three different times in the book of Acts. It weighed heavy on him. I mean, he took people, couples, they, it says he went house to house and jerked the parents out of there and left the children to the state and put them in jail and tortured them, trying to get them to recant their faith. He was a dude. He said, he said, I tried to make them abandon their faith. In Acts chapter 9, verse 13, we learn that on the road to Damascus, when he got to Damascus, what was the guy's name in Damascus that met him? Was it Ananias? Yeah, he had already heard of him. He was his reputation as a cruel, heartless persecutor had, had spread all around. So he was famous for his cruelty and his torture of Christians. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, if you'll go there with me just for a second, Paul, all through his writings, especially to the Corinthians, he makes some strange statements. They're complaints. In verse 1, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? See, they, many people said he wasn't. Many people said he's not. he wasn't with the Lord. He wasn't one of the twelve, and therefore he's disqualified. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? See, that was the qualification to be one of the twelve. You had to see the Lord. Are you not working the Lord if to others I'm not an apostle? See, others said, this guy's not an apostle. He's a, he's a counterfeit. At least I am to you, for you are my seal of apostleship in the Lord. I want you to see his, his complaining, his complaint about being denied the recognition of who he was, of his position. He, he apparently graded on him. Go to 2 Corinthians 12, and you'll see another example of this same thing. And he says in verse 11, I have become foolish. <laughs> you yourselves have compelled me. He blames them for it. Actually, I should have been commended. I should have been praised by you. For in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles. He calls them super apostles. Peter and, you know, John, these super apostles that everybody thinks are so great. And he's comparing himself to them. Uh, Even though I'm a nobody, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches except that I myself did not burden you uh, with financial support? So you see him talk about the other apostles in this complaining way, and it lets you know that Paul was even to the point of being resentful that he didn't get the same recognition that they did. This was what I believe. And I, look, I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm pretty, pretty confident uh, that this is what motivates him to go to Jerusalem, 
stand toe-to-toe with these guys and tell them about his ministry. I've been to a few pastor's conferences, and one of the things that's, that's always part of a pastor's conference is the bragamony, where everybody tells you what all's going on and how many people they've got and how many ministries they've got going and what all great things they've done and how many degrees they've got and everything. And um, I always had to be real quiet in those meetings because I didn't have much. So uh, Now, Paul writes First and Second Corinthians, we believe in the year A.D. 56. This Acts 21 in Jerusalem is A.D. 57. One year before he goes to Jerusalem, these things are on his mind. They are eating away at his heart. I believe these things are motivating him. So, Saul of Tarsus, highly intelligent, Deeply educated and very ambitious for success and recognition. There's nothing wrong with it. It's normal to desire praise. Praise from others indicates you're doing something good. It's a good thing. Praise is a good thing. But it easily gets hijacked by the sin nature and becomes a need. And we'll see that. He made himself, look at what he did. He made himself very visible in all of his endeavors. When he persecuted the church, he had to be out front. When he got all the Christians persecuted in Jerusalem, that wasn't enough for him. He went and got permission from the Sanhedrin, the the elders, to go to other cities and persecute. I mean, he had to be very, he was very out front and visible. Everything he did was that way. He appears to be hurt or upset that the churches didn't readily identify him as an apostle. I mean, it's understandable that they didn't. I mean, he doesn't look like any of the rest of them. He didn't walk with the 12. He doesn't teach the same thing that they're all teaching. He teaches something different. Listen, that was his, that was, he went round and round with people about that. He writes the book of Galatians to the Jews, basically to the legalists, to help them understand the law is over. Nobody gets saved by the law, ever. Nobody's, listen, the Jews took the law and turned it into a system of salvation. You were good enough if you kept the law, and God would approve of you if you kept the law. It was never meant to be that never it was a teacher to show you that you couldn't be saved it led you to christ so he compromised divine revelation given to him by jesus himself so that he could get along with the legalist in the jerusalem church so what do you do with that you know if you're if you're with some people In a social setting, you get along. You know, you don't, if you're out to dinner with some friends and they speak up and they got some legalistic views, I mean, I, I believe the issue is your desire and your motive. If you have a desire to edify them and you do this under the ministry of the Spirit, you can be quite appropriate to share your belief. But, to confront people because they have wrong views in social settings is generally not helpful. You just look like an, you know, what you look like. But this is not the social setting. This is Paul with James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, where he should have stood strong and looked James in the eye and said, remember the Acts 15 conference remember what we came up with the letter we wrote to all the gentiles and now you're trying to make them go back and be circumcised and keep the law he should have stood up he did he did in galatians 2 go to galatians 2 right quick y'all know that passage with peter
Galatians 2.11, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Prior to coming of, to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. You see, what is Peter afraid of? That he's going to be criticized. He's going to be separated. He's going to be castigated. So Peter gives in to his desire to belong with his Jewish buddies. So here's Paul, uh, and he said, I confronted him before in the presence of all. If you being a Jew live like Gentiles and not like Jews, how is it that you now compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So he did it earlier in his ministry, in his life, but when it came down to his opportunity to stand with the big boys, he compromised himself. He wanted something out of it that was he was willing to compromise himself. Paul was a judgmental rule keeper personality. Now the rule keeper personality has a wonderful role under the spirit. It keeps life orderly. It keeps it take they take care of the boundaries. They keep things running orderly and smoothly and properly. They 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 have uh, they're, the rule keepers are very aware of the boundaries, but they easily become judgmental and condemning, even cruel and inflexible. And this is what when Paul was, before Paul was saved, he was extremely cruel. I mean, when you take a man and woman out of their home so that their children are left to the state and you torture them trying to get them to recant, that's hard. Listen, over spiritual beliefs, of course this was a different time in, in human history where these things were very important. The, people did the same things in Europe over with, with all that condemning one another and burning people at the stake for, I don't know, 1500, 1600, yeah. So up until 1600, 1600 years later, people are still doing this, what Paul did. Yeah, so you can see that, that his personality and his uh, tendencies were to be this hard, cruel, inflexible person. He kept the law, listen, this is why he was with himself. He had to keep the law blameless. He didn't ever let down. Every day that he was supposed to be there, he showed up on time, did the right thing. And look, he thought that by doing the right thing every single time, it protected him. It protected him from judgment, from being called out, from, from not being praised, from being criticized. It protected him. And that's part of what motivates us to do, to live like that, is we're afraid, terrified of criticism, of being rejected for not doing the right thing. Now, he rejected Gamaliel's counsel, who apparently, uh, Gamaliel was considered, he is considered one of the seven great Jews of human history. I mean, his name is still revered. Gamaliel was uh, incredibly wise. I mean, you listen to what he said about the church. Give it time. It'll show itself for what it is. What a wise thing. Now, his, Paul's ambition to be recognized was a strategy of his old man belief system. It needed to be discarded. The desire for approbation and recognition is a normal and appropriate desire for praise. You see it in every child. If you've had children, look at me, look at me. The desire to be recognized for their accomplishments, for their growth, for what they can do that they couldn't do before. They're proud, you know, and, and boundaries there are something you're going to have to pray about. You know, I, don't, I know, I know any, nobody in here has got little kids, but you've got little grandkids. So anyway, I'll leave that to you you and the Holy Spirit. But this desire for normal praise 
gets hijacked by the sin nature. It turns a desire for recognition and praise into an idolatrous method for happiness. An idolatrous method for happiness. I would suggest that somebody in our country who's very, very high up in our government has an issue with that. Can't stand criticism, any, any at all, and must be praised. That's a weakness. It's not a strength. It's not a good thing. My opinion, you know, for all the good that's there, the conservative principles that are being followed, that's good for the nation. But I'll, I'll mind my own business. We form a belief, and out of that belief, we form an image of success using inner dialogue to guide us toward that image. We tell ourselves, if I can only accomplish what, what I see in my mind as success, then I will be fulfilled and happy. I mean, earlier, and listen, if you're an honest person and you're able to look at yourself, you fight this stuff, all through your life, you, you fight against the motive to be better than others or to be recognized for your greatness. You See, the sin nature turns everything normal and good in life into something selfish all about me. That's what it does. And all of our ideas that form as we develop are about serving me. Paul is still serving Paul. He didn't go to Jerusalem for the Lord. He said he did. He even convinced himself that he did. But this is not for the Lord or he wouldn't have done what he did. He sure didn't go to the temple and do this vow thing for the Lord. So he's still motivated by his earthly agenda for success and fulfillment, believing that he can get it through his own actions and deeds. Listen. <clears throat> The moment you trusted in Christ as Savior, God pronounced you righteous in Christ. That's as high as you're ever going to be. There is no more praise than that. The only reason that we are ever going to be praised in the eternal state is for how we followed the Spirit and lived the Christian life. None of it's going to be about you. None of it. The only thing that you're going to get credit for is listening and believing and, and following. It's all God. It's all God. But the old system, our old way, is about me. It's about what I do or what I don't do. That's what, because you hold on to that do or don't do, it, it forces you into uh, the law. Because these people couldn't give up the idea that what they did or didn't do determined their destiny. They had to have boundaries and rules to keep. They had to have the law, and they couldn't let it go. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Look, they could have still followed the law and not called it the law. But they had to do the washings, and they had to do the circumcisions, and they had to do the rituals believing that their doing of those things somehow gave them presence with God, didn't it? Now, Paul's image, and I'm just suggesting this, of being received and accepted into the fellowship by the Jewish apostles and, and the Jewish people, praised for his understanding and hard work. And look, boy, did he understand? You bet he did. You did, did Paul work hard? He worked harder than anybody. And, of course, he's going to tell you that he worked harder than anybody else. Right? I produced more than all of them put together. Well, we really needed to know that, Paul. And he gives you this list of hardships that he forced. And in, in, in addition to that, boy, I had the churches too. What a great guy you are, Paul. I mean, so his image for uh, being praised for his understanding and hard work spreading the gospel 
and the church among the Gentiles. He wanted his people, the Jews, to accept Jesus as the Messiah, seeing their acceptance as his fulfillment. Turn to Romans chapter 10, just real quick. And listen to that, listen to this silly statement he makes. This is ridiculous. Chapter 10, verse 3. Oh, uh, wait, it's 9. Is it 9? It's 9. Yep, he says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my, my brothers, the Jews, my kinsmen, according to... To the flesh. In other words, Paul said, I would give up my salvation if they could be saved. 9 3. I'm sorry, I put 10 3. It's 9 3. Yeah, it's in chapter 9, verse 3. So, look, this guy, this guy knows a lot. This guy works hard. This guy has accomplished. God has used him to do a lot of great things. But inside, he's still got a lot of work to do. And if you can't see yourself in this, like I'm seeing myself, this is me. I've still got a lot of work to do on my motives, on my beliefs, because I'll tell you, when I look at the way that, my, that I conduct my life, my marriage, my family, my career, my decisions, I see areas where I don't measure up to the Lord in any shape or form. And, and listen, that's a mystery because I have maximum doctrine. I mean, you don't hardly know anybody that's got more than me. It's been my life for 40 years. I've got the Holy Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, and I still come up short. How can that be? How can that be? Am I just going, well, forget God. I'm going to go live like Cain for a while. No. Trust me, that's not it. It's that I still have old ideas encrusted in my soul that when the right circumstances come, boom. It comes to the surface and I, and, and I choose it and I believe it and I grab a hold of it and I operate from anger or frustration or fear or whatever it is. Every time that happens, it reveals to me what needs to change. The fact that I've not yet changed it <laughs> indicates my character. My character. But in Acts 21, Paul ignores the word of the Spirit through the believers in Tyre and the prophet Agabus. Don't set foot in Jerusalem. You're going to be bound hand and foot. Paul rejected the Spirit's warnings by justifying himself as willing to suffer for Christ. Again, that reminds me of Peter. Peter's willing to pull out the sword and, and fight and die to protect the Lord when the Lord's already told him his will is to be taken to die in Jerusalem, to be three days and then resurrected. That's the will. Peter, it's not the will of God that you die tonight. But he didn't listen, and he's going to fight. And look, he's going to justify himself and say, well, at least I tried. At least I tried. But look, he's going to come face to face with the Lord <laughs> in that image when he gives his third uh, denial with, with curse words included, and he, and he looks over at Jesus, and Jesus is looking at him right in the eye, and it said he, went, he, he just broke him. It broke him. I mean, he went out and wept bitterly. He saw himself. That moment became one of the great moments of Peter's life. His life turned on that moment. It revealed to him who he really was inside, that this was not about him 
in his old way of thinking and his trying harder and harder and being a good old boy and a good friend to Jesus. So what's when Jesus came? Peter, do you love me? Agapao, are you committed to me? Are you willing to give everything to me? And he said, Lord, you know that, I, I, you know that I'm your friend. Oh, you know that I'm your friend. You know that I love you like a friend. And Jesus is like, and what am I looking for, Peter? I'm not looking for, I'm glad you like me as a friend, Peter. I'm looking for agapao. I'm looking for commitment. I'm looking for all the way. Feed my sheep. So, Paul rejected the Spirit's warnings. He justified himself as willing to suffer. I'm willing to be bound and even die. He refused to be persuaded, and they were silent. He said, I'm willing to suffer any adversity, telling himself that his motive was to serve the Lord. Underneath his desire to further the gospel was his desire to be recognized for his great genius. When we disobey God about his will, we go into, a, we begin to go backwards. That moment when we stop listening to the Spirit and being willing to obey the Spirit, we go backwards. We call it reversing, reverting, reversionism. In reversionism, we replace listening and submitting to God with our own justifications, our own explanations as to why we're doing something other than what the Spirit told us to do. The old man motives disguised themselves as Christian motives. This began to happen the moment he disobeyed God. So ask yourself, what are your motives for doing what you do in the Christian life? What are your motives? If you don't know, then that would say you need to invest some time and effort into becoming aware. Where do you fail? Where do you consistently fail in the spiritual life? That would be the immediate area that God would want you to work on and to work on with you in, that, in your soul. Because in my opinion, it's just my opinion, it's a very good opinion, based on my study of the Word, that God is all about purifying us freeing us from our wrong ideas that still control us. Look, I know you guys know a lot. You know more than probably anybody in this city as far as an average believer. But that does was still teaching new believers that they must believe and then keep the law. Paul had taught correctly, the law was ended. Legalistic believers were confused by false teaching. James said, compromise the truth so that you can appeal to these legalistic believers and keep unity among us. Of course, Paul, listen, Paul wasn't even supposed to be there. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He was out of God's will, period. <laughs> Nothing good is going to happen when you're out of God's will. Paul's desire for Jewish approval and perhaps fear of disapproval motivated his compromise of truth. He knew better than anyone that the Nazarite vow of these new believers was worthless. It was wrong. His desire for acceptance by his own people. I mean, he's willing to give up his own salvation to see his own people saved. Nonsense. His desire for their acceptance rather than who he was in Christ drove his actions. Listen, the only satisfaction, the only fulfillment that you're ever going to experience in this life that is legitimate is going to come from who you are in Christ. Who you are in Christ. Not your accomplishments, not how smart you are, not how great you are, not how pretty you are, not how famous you are, none of that's going to matter. Who you are in Christ is the basis for your self-esteem or you don't have any. You have pseudo self-esteem. You have earthly agenda self-esteem. 
And listen, this is, this is for all of us. Nobody escapes the damage of Adam's sin. Nobody. You, you, you're born with a sin nature from that. You inherited sinful tendencies from your parents because of that. And you parlay those tendencies into your own beliefs and ideas that, that create a system of beliefs and behavior that's earthly, that's worldly. Hey, you get saved one day and you begin to learn doctrine and you think, man, if I learn enough of this, somehow it will either smother that or push it off the table or something. But you learn that it doesn't work that way. You learn after a while, if you're, if you're honest, that it doesn't work. You're still being motivated deep down by things that aren't of the Lord. You're not doing it for the Lord. And that which is going to be rewardable in heaven is going to be done for his sake, not mine. When I do a great Christian thing for my sake, then the reward. Right after he discussed how some people are going to get there, as through fire, everything's going to the motives of not to get, I'm not trying to be psychological. I'm just saying I'm an introvert. You see, I live within, and I'm, it's easier for me to see myself and deal with myself. Extroverts have a harder time. Doesn't change the fact that the battle for your Christian life is in your soul. It's not in your body. It's not in your outer here. It's inside of you. And you've got to take the, make the, you've got to recognize that and believe that and, and observe yourself and be aware of yourself. You can, you can do it by looking at what you produce in your life. What am I producing? What am I producing? Do I help anybody? I mean, are people glad to see me coming? So, I'm preaching. This image that he had of acceptance and this inner dialogue that he had from the spirit, I mean, this inner dialogue of this earthly agenda had silenced the voice of the spirit. He quit listening to the spirit. Listen, there was the spirit speaks to him through other people. Look, these, he can no longer speak to Paul's soul because Paul has shut him down, called grieving and quenching. He has shut him down. So, the Spirit sends other people. He used to didn't have to have other people. The Spirit would speak to Paul, and Paul was sensitive to that. He would listen, but now. So it was through this experience of falling victim to his own earthly ambition that Paul learned that in spite of his superior knowledge that he still had to be purified of his old man beliefs and habits. This incident happened a year later in 57. So this is right in this period where he's struggling with this whole thing about being, because this is a misunderstood passage. This is where Paul is talking about living, the walking in newness, letting the dead be the dead and walking in newness of life. And verse 6, he says, knowing this, that our old self, our old man was crucified with him. That's positional death of the old man and positional freedom, the breaking of the bondage of the sin nature. This is called regeneration. At regeneration, you get a whole new spiritual system powered by the Holy Spirit. Before that, you've got only your own mind and sin nature to drive you and motivate you and, and guide you. So in when the old self was crucified with him, this breaks that Hold on. But he says, so that, it's hena plus the subjunctive meaning, it's a purpose clause for this reason. So that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now this term body of sin, I am believing to mean not just the sin nature in the hole that it had, but the system that resulted from it that we carry with us into the Christian life, the whole way of thinking. Because here's what's important. When it says so that it might be done away with, that's an aorist subjunctive meaning future potential. At salvation, your old man is crucified, but 
putting aside the results of the old man so that you're no longer a slave to sin is potential. That's what we're talking about tonight. You don't get free of the old man system at salvation. It's crucified, so you break the hold of it. But future potential is that you live your life and you grow and you renew your mind and you lay aside the old and you put on the new and you become this channel through God's grace can flow. Father, we're grateful. I pray that these things can be understood and seen in the scriptures, not as sim something that I just like to talk about. Not it, This stuff is critical, Father. It's critical that we understand lest we know so much and yet really, truly, it, within our heart of hearts, not live up to it. I, I desire, Lord, for all of us to succeed in your eyes, to become the people that you desire us to become that. The how. How do we do it? How do we become that, Father? We know what we're supposed to do, but we just don't know how to do it. If we did, we'd already done it. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.